Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you guys this morning. How many of you got wet on the way here? Good, good. All right. Good to see you guys. Glad you made it. You didn't melt, so that's a good sign. You ever make a decision you regret? So uh, this week on Friday I, afternoon, I was mowing my grass and uh, going through the whole yard, you know, mowing the grass. And there was one limb on a flowering tree that we have was hanging down a little bit, and it, I was going to just duck under it. And as I went through it, I kind of ducked. And then I realized as I went through it, it was full of bees. I looked down, there were bees on my shirt. And I, I, did, I tried not to overreact, and I went like this, and a bee stung me here. And I realized this morning that I also have stings on my legs, on the back of my neck. So um, if you don't know about me, I tend to be allergic to things. So can I just say that I'm regretting that decision to drive through that limb that I thought was no big deal? You know, in life so often, if we're not careful, we focus so much on avoiding pain that we actually can make things worse. And uh, if you've ever had an abscessed tooth, you know that you don't just wait and say, It'll probably go away, and I know better than to leave for North Carolina for our mission trip in the morning without some type of medicine. I am high on Benadryl this morning, so this could be fun, but doesn't necessarily make my sermons any more unusual, because you just never know what will happen. Oh, by the way, just a little side note, I'm leaving tomorrow. And so my daughter Jenna flew in from Seattle. She heard I was going out of town. And... Should I get the hint by that? I don't know. We're proud of you, Jenna. We are so glad you're here. And uh, anyway, uh, this morning we're going to talk about uh, another uh, really kind of a cool chapter that you've probably, I, I don't know if you've done it, uh, talked about it or not. It's from Daniel chapter 5. Uh, this is where we get the expression, the writing on the wall. How many of you have ever heard the expression, the writing on the wall, right? And so usually you talk about that when, for example, you say to somebody, they should have known they were getting fired. They should have seen the writing on the wall. Or they should have known they were in trouble. They should have seen it. So that's where we get it. Well, we get it from this story. This is the story that has gone through all generations to the point that you can be listening to a song like There is Superstition and hear writing on the wall. And such a great song. Such a great song. And, and hear about that. And if you noticed in that video in the middle, he said, I should have seen the writing on the wall. I don't know if you caught the, the little phrase in there where he said that. But the truth is, for all of us, there's times that we should see the writing on the wall. We should be able to evaluate life and say, what's going on? But the truth is... Um, you know, you can look at this story in two ways. This king was either very arrogant, which is one of his problems, and that was what we talked about last week. But the other one that I'm looking at this week as we come into this chapter is I really believe that this king honestly was just trying to avoid reality and seeking pleasure and avoiding pain, which is what people do. So today we're going to talk about these uh, uh, things that we should see, three truths that should be obvious, and we're going to talk about uh, actions having consequences, uh, friends and advisors matter, and then recognizing that God is sovereign. We're going to look at those three keys. There's more keys to that in life, but in this story, those are the three big ones that stand out. And anybody who has uh, uh, raised kids or looked back at their teenage years realizes how important, uh, especially number one and two are, for how we live our life. Do you know anybody who distracts themselves from the real issues in life? As we pick up this story in Daniel chapter 5, what's happening outside the city gates is there's a group, the Medes and the Persians, who are getting ready to attack Babylon. Now, if you don't know who the Medes or the Persians are, if you watch the movie 300 and you see that one group of people that's totally terrifying, that's who we're talking about. And so this army that's getting ready to come into the city, but this king thinks, I'm safe. By the way, he's the substitute king. Uh, the real king liked to travel, so he said, you're in charge. And so this guy stays there, and the real king is taking off and, and you know, 
seeing the city, playing golf, uh, going up to Camp David or whatever they did back then. I'm glad you guys caught that. That was very good. Very good. So, uh, so what's happening is they're right outside the city. They think they're safe. Remember, the Babylon not only had water coming into the city, but they had lots of food. They had the hanging gardens of Babylon. They had huge walls. They were double moated. They had lots of security measures. And the truth was, it would be impossible. Even if they were under siege, they could live under siege for a long time. So they weren't worried about it. They thought the Medes and the Persians were outside the gates building siege works. What they didn't know is what they actually were doing was getting the river to go a different direction. And as they did that, what were they doing? They were now making a way where they literally could just walk in to the city using those very moats that were their safety. But here's what the king does. Let's pick it up in Daniel chapter 5, verse 3 through 7. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Time out. So what's he doing? They know that there's another group outside of the city. They know that they're under attack. They know that this other group wants to conquer them. And so what they're doing is they're saying, look, we're so awesome, we conquered the God of the Israelites. And so this is basically mocking the Israelites' God, who, by the way, his grandfather, this king's grandfather, finally honored after, uh, well, we talked about that last week. You'll have to Google it. And so the truth is what's happening here is, He's like, you know what? Let's just party. Let's not worry about what's happening outside the gates. And then the story continues. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Now, I debated about telling you this. But this is written in Aramaic. It's one of the few parts of the Bible written in Aramaic. And this is one of those where when they're translating scripture, they get to tell you what it says. And so here they say, his knees were knocking. Where in Aramaic, it literally says he lost control of his loins. Peter's pants. Okay, so, but they didn't want to write that here, and I get it, because in church you laugh when the pastor says that. I get it. So, but, but, but that's, a, that's a pretty good image. So basically, the king is looking one way, the people are all looking at him, he sees the handwriting on the wall, he freaks out, is scared, ter- and I don't know if you've ever been so scared you couldn't speak. Have you ever been that scared? When I was a kid one time, I, was, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I, my room was upstairs, and I saw flashlights in Miami downstairs in our house. And I remember going like this. So I had my radio near me because I was in junior high. I cranked the radio. It blasted. And then I yelled, Dad, somebody's in the house, to which flashlights began to move. And I suddenly was brave again. By the way, they didn't get anything that time. I remember when I first moved up here, I would tell people, they would say, Have you ever, were you ever robbed? i go, yeah, we were in a good neighborhood. We were only robbed twice. And that would really, and I meant it. That did not seem odd to me to say. And then I moved up here and people were like, what? What kind of neighborhood were you in? I'm like, I was in a good neighborhood. We were only robbed twice. I'm like, huh? And so that's, did you know that about Miami? Okay, there you go. So. Has nothing to do with the sermon. We're blaming Benadryl for that. All right, here we go. (laughs) You can blame it for my Aramaic too. All right, here we go. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. Remember the group that that his grandfather had summoned before? And he said... uh, Uh, Then he said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain, or as I like to call it, a Mr. T starter kit placed around his neck and he'll be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So 
Here's what's going on. The king is partying. He's drinking out of the temple goblets. He's showing off that my gods are better than these other gods. And then all of a sudden, a hand appears. Now, I don't know if it looked like Fang from the monsters. I, I don't know if it was bigger than that. Small, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't say, well, someday we'll know. Maybe this is where they got the idea for the TV show. I don't know. But all of a sudden, a hand's writing on the wall. You would freak out too. What's funny is, he could have been freaking out before this if he had looked over the wall to see what the enemy was doing, but he was too busy partying, and so now he gets the literal writing on the wall, and he says, can somebody tell me what this means? He suddenly is awakened. By the way, it says the word suddenly, which means that he wasn't taking anything seriously. He was just enjoying himself, and then boom. You ever had one of those moments in life? I know it's hard to believe, but I talked a lot in school. And I can remember those moments where the teacher would go, Eric? What's funny is being ADD was a huge advantage because sometimes the teacher would say, Eric, tell me what I just said. And I would say what they just said, even though I wasn't paying any attention to them. It was infuriating to my teachers, just so you know. But here's some ways sometimes that we seek pleasure and avoid pain. Maybe you know some of these. We reach for a drink anytime we feel stressed. We leave a relationship every time things get tough or we quit talking. We people please until we're spread paper thin. We think that our job is to make everybody happy. So we think, well, if I can just make everybody happy, and what do we do? We just exhaust ourselves. We try to avoid the pain of being honest with them and going, I really didn't want to help with that. We procrastinate on important tasks and projects. Nobody does that. I don't know why I read that. We hover over our kids to try to spare them negative feelings. By the way, sometimes the best thing you can do for your kids is let them experience a little bit of negative feelings. I know you want to, and I'm not saying don't protect, please protect them, protect your children from some of the craziness in the world, but the truth is you have to let them fail sometimes. You have to let them struggle sometimes. You have to give them a chance to figure out how to walk. You can't hold their hands their whole lives. My kids are big. <laughs> Except for Ricky. <laughs> he was giving me a hard time. Okay. <laughs> By the way, his birthday's tomorrow. He expects gifts. <clears throat> and then finally, we talk ourselves out of our dreams or ambitions. Some of you have a vision for what you should do, but the pain to accomplish it is more than you want to bear, so you just rather watch Netflix. Rather watch that series. What's the important thing that you may have to experience pain in order to do? Because the truth is, listen, your life will not be all that God has for it if all you do is avoid pain and seek pleasure. I learned a very important quote years ago from a great movie. Life is pain, your highness. Anyone who tells you different is just selling you something. And the truth is, there is pain in life. And when you go to accomplish anything that matters, there will be pain sometimes. And there are times that the truth is, if we do everything we can to avoid pain, all we're doing is delaying the pain, and in some cases, making the pain worse. So I want to encourage you, deal with what God wants you to deal with today, whether it's hard or not. Listen to this verse. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. By the way, uh, sowing towards the flesh is like cotton candy. Cotton candy's great until you're done with it. And then it's sticky. It's all over your nose. It's everywhere. You're, you've got a sugar rush that's over. You're now sad and depressed. Right? That's sin. That's sin. That's the flesh. So, so it looks good. It feels good. It seems great. But it's cotton candy. It's done. And it's done quick. And then it continues. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. 
But sometimes in life when you choose to do what God wants you to, can I tell you, that doesn't mean it's easy. Even what Daniel did as you go through the book of Daniel and you go through the things he walked through and went through, I am sure there were times that Daniel's like, again? By the way, as a Christian, I don't think God ever fails you. You will never fail a test. You'll just get a retake. And so, like, you're struggling with that certain person in your life now, and maybe you know that they're getting ready to move on, and you're thinking, oh, good, I'm done with that. And God's like, retake. Here's another person that will do the exact same thing. Oh, great. And sometimes in life, we just have to work through the pain of whatever we're dealing with and say, God, would you deal with me now? You know, one of the things I didn't realize till too long ago, I love the movie Ferris Bueller. How many of you have ever seen the movie Ferris Bueller? You've heard of that? By the way, when my class, when my Sunday school class is really quiet, all I can think in my head is Bueller, Bueller. And then I think, wait, that makes me that guy, which could be true. So anyway, do you ever realize how selfish and self-centered Ferris Bueller is? I know it's a great movie and I know it's fun to watch, but think about what a jerk he is. He uses his friends... He doesn't care about anybody but himself. He's looking out for his own interests all the time. And whatever he needs to do to manipulate or control others, he does. At their expense for his own pleasure. That's what the flesh always does. When you find yourself constantly saying, me, my, me, my, then recognize that the flesh is sneaking in. And if you start hearing Bueller, Bueller, go get therapy. <laughs> the meaning of life is not pain-free. Number two, our friends and advisors matter. You ever look back at your life and you wish there was that one friend that you had never met or had never listened to? Most people have something like that where they're like, yeah. Please don't call them and tell them that. If you're married to them, don't look at them during this sermon. But we all know someone who listened to the wrong people. And just over a month ago, we all read about the Titan sub that had gone down to see the Titanic. And we know the story of the Titanic was about people who didn't listen to the right people. And then a submarine goes down with a guy who didn't listen to the right people. Did you know over 30-something maritime groups had written letters not only to the people who had that sub, but to the groups that were supposed to evaluate that sub and said, this is dangerous, someone's going to die. And they all went, eh. When you listen to the wrong people, it can destroy your life. When you listen to the wrong people, they'll guide you the wrong way. They will help you develop habits that you'll have a hard time getting rid of. Selfishness and self-centeredness, all kind of things can sneak into your life when you listen to the wrong people. This king listened to the wrong people. Listen to what happens next. So King Belshazzar, that's his name by the way, became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. That's an awesome word just in itself. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles. So she was outside the party. Most likely she was uh, 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 his grandparent. He, she was probably his wife, so grandpa's wife. The queen, hearing the voice of the king and nobles, came into the banquet. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There's a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, and that word literally just means your ancestor. In the time of your ancestor, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and dividers. Which, by the way, is interesting that they called all those guys in, and Daniel, once again, was not included in that group. You think a little jealousy took place still? He did this because Daniel, who the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a king mind, knowledge, and understanding, and also the ability to interpret deems, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. And then she says this, call for Daniel. Basically, you need some good advice. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. I hope you have somebody in your life that when you have to make big decisions... 
when you're dealing with a problem that you don't know what to do with, when life's a little bit painful, I hope you have a friend that you can call or even text and say, hey, would you pray for me? Or that you can call and say, hey, I'm dealing with this. What do you think? Because you know why we need a good friend? We need a good friend that we can call sometimes when we're dealing with something and we say these words to them. Listen, I feel like I'm crazy, but this is what's happening. And you need a friend that you don't know. They may say to you, you're not crazy. Don't worry about it. But that same friend, if it's a good friend, will also say, yes, you're crazy. <laughs> You're not dealing with that. You need a friend who will say either of those things. That's a good friend. A good friend, one that will sometimes say to you, no, you're not. What you're dealing with is normal. It's okay. You know, that's just weird. You're, you're fine. That's, we all deal with that. Or they'll say to you, no, no, you're nuts. That's, that's not, you, you, you got to deal with that. That's a problem. Do you have a friend like that you can call? I love that the queen goes and says to, to him, hey, you know, I know you've called all these other smart guys that don't know what they're doing. Well, why don't you call Daniel? Because he actually knows what he's talking about. We all need that person. And by the way, <laughs> I think she knew he wasn't going to like what he heard. And you need that person in your life that doesn't mind saying to you, you may not like what I'm about to say. Now, they're not doing it to get you. You don't want that. You don't want a friend who's excited to share bad news with you. You don't want a friend that looks at you and goes, I just can't wait to put you in your place. You don't, that's not, that's Ferris Bueller. You don't need that friend. 1 Corinthians 15, you heard me talk to the kids. Do not be misled, bad cor company corrupts good character. So, so let me give you a few things that are painful to do that might be a good lesson for you to help you to have better boundaries. Because life really is about boundaries. It's letting the right friends in. And not letting the wrong friends in. Do you understand what a boundary is? A, a boundary is not there to build a wall to keep everybody out. A boundary is to keep the right people out, but to let the right people in. You have a gate, right? So you let the right people in. And so here's some little lessons for you. Maybe some things that you can try, some practical applications. Here we go. Learn to say no to people, projects, and activities when your plate is full. Unless the pastor asks. Oh, I'm sorry. I wrote that in there. No, the truth is you have to have a good no. If you're going to be a balanced person, you have to have a good no. Now listen, you might have a bad no. You might say no to everything. Well, if you say no to everything, you're also not doing God's will. Because God's will is often uncomfortable. I, I have hardly ever done something God wanted me to do that I thought, this is great, I can't wait. Usually I was like, this is exciting and terrifying. Somebody said, are you excited about the mission trip? And I said, no. No. Like, why aren't you excited? You should be excited about going. I'll be excited once I'm there. I'm excited. All I'm thinking about is having to drive up there and figuring out everything. You, you, yeah, you'll help. All right. Number two, listen to this. Oh, yeah, good. Thanks. Listen to this one. Resolve a conflict with a family member. That doesn't sound fun. Scratch that one off. Listen to this. This is going to hurt you. Hold on tight. Listen with an open mind to someone who has a different political view than yours. You realize we live in a society where people make money by making you think that somebody who thinks differently than you is your enemy. So be very careful that there's times that you listen with an open mind, even if you don't agree with somebody. That, listen, if every time you don't agree with somebody, you think, well, they're just stupid then you've been, you're the one who's been tricked. Well, they're just idiots. Well, you've been tricked then. So be careful. Make sure that you don't think. Just write them off. I mean, they may be. I've got, I got you. But not just because of what they're saying and not just because of what they believe or who they vote for. Be careful about that. Number next. You're not going to like this one either. Wake up early to move your body even when you're exhausted and it's dark outside. This is for those of you who are socially awkward. Here we go. I do not need this next one at all. Staying at an event where you feel socially anxious. Wow. I 
don't know what that's like. All right, next. Turning down a drink, food, or other substance at a social event when you know you've had enough. I love the next one. Traveling with small kids. Talk, talk about, and this is, this is pain that will help you. That's what this is called. This is titled, pain that will help you. Traveling with small kids. That's what Benadryl's for. All right, here we go. Sorry, did I say that out loud? That meant to stay in. That was the Benadryl talking. That wasn't me. Asking for a raise, time off, or to work more from home in the new year. I guess that was written in New Year's. Here we go. Our actions have consequences. Our friends and advisor matter. Number three, recognize that God is sovereign. Some of you are miserable because you think you can control everything or everyone. And when you can't control how a person responds... When you can't control what's going to happen next, you get frustrated and aggravated. And so you're pretty much living frustrated and aggravated. One of the first things I learned when I worked maintenance was how to run a buffer. I don't know if you remember those big buffer machines. And I got to run that big buffer. I'll never forget, the guy who taught me how to do it, he, he had it started. And he said, okay, you try it. And, of course, I grabbed the handle, pushed down, and was rammed into the wall. And he said, well, you won't do that again. Well, now that I have a concussion, no, I won't. But over time, guess what I learned? I learned how to balance it and recognize that I wasn't really in control. All I was doing was guiding that machine. Listen, when it comes to your children, all you're doing is guiding them. When it comes to your life, so often, all you're getting to do is guide it. You can't always control everything that happens. This is not heaven yet. And so the truth is, you don't, you don't get to, to every day go in with the Smurfs to work. Barney doesn't come and visit you. I love you. Don't you love me? Well, except for Rodney. That was very nice this morning, Rodney. Yeah. So listen to what happens next. So, so Daniel now, he said, Daniel, tell me what you think. Which is, you know, you have friends like that, right? Where you're like, tell me what you think. That's what happens here. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. And then a few verses later, Daniel goes into his sermon. But you, Belteshazzar, his son, you haven't humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you've set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and your nobles, your wives, your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which can't see or understand. But you did not honor the God, listen, who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. The inscription that was written said, meeny, meeny, tekel, parson. Basically, uh, uh, what this says, I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Here's what it means. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You've been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persian. Then, at Belteshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. That was very expensive, by the way. And a Mr. T starter kit was placed. I know it doesn't say that was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third, why, because that's all he could get, third highest in the kingdom. See, when you looked at this writing on the wall, it would be like saying $100, $50, $25, $12.5, you know, whatever the math is. And then, so, the, so the other guys couldn't decide it. Daniel said, hey, God's seen that you don't measure up. You're, you're trying to do all these things thinking you're more powerful than you are, but tonight your kingdom's going to end. He was made aware that God's in charge. By the way, you're going to have times in life where you feel like you know what's next. And then you're going to discover that you don't know what's next. And that's when we need to recognize ahead of time, God, you're in charge. God, I need your help. God, I need your guidance. God, thank you for what you've given me. Thank you, Lord, for a good day. And even when you're going through a bad day, you say, Lord, thank you for a bad day. Lord, thank you for another day where I can take a breath, even with arthritis. Even though I'm going through this struggle, that I can recognize that you are good. And you're going to walk me through whatever is next. In Colossians 1, it says this, The Son is the invisible image, excuse me, the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers, authority, all things have been created through him and for him. If you want to have a meaningful life, not only do you need to recognize that you're not in control, but you need to recognize who is. And I can promise you, even on the hardest days when you say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. God, thank you for all these things that you've given me. God, thank you you've given me the ability to even deal with this today. But God, I need your strength. Be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you let influence your life. Be careful of the actions that you take in your life because all of those things have consequences regardless of what the world tries to tell you. If you're here today and you've never with your life said, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you knowing that you died for me and rose again. Knowing that you paid for my sins because I'm messed up and broken. If you want to give your life to Christ today, I'll be here after the service and you can say, today I want to give my life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and the truth is you've got some areas in your life that you've not wanted to deal with the pain. Make a new commitment to God. You know what, God, I, I want your guidance to deal with this situation, this circumstance, this person. Would you guide me into how to do that? And ask for his direction. He gives wisdom, the Bible says, to those who ask for it. Maybe that's what you need today. Let's close in prayer this morning. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you for this story of Daniel where we see someone who had wisdom from you and Lord could share it with others. I pray, Father, that you'd give us friends like that. Friends who love you, who feed the Spirit, but Lord, who also will help us as we walk through this journey of life. And Lord, we thank you that you are in charge and in control. We thank you that all good things come from you. We give you the glory now for that. In Jesus' name, amen.